In this video, we will discuss how imperialism has developed since Lenin published his pamphlet in 1916, which provided five economic features of how the previous era of capitalism developed into monopoly capitalism. Does his analysis still hold true in today's world? Let's find out. Welcome to the Peace Report an anti-imperialist media outlet with the aim of providing accurate analyses of imperialism and updates on anti-imperialist struggles around the world. This channel depends on support from viewers, so please share our content, like our videos, subscribe to this YouTube channel, and if you can go further, become a supporter on Patreon. Sources and more information will always be posted in the description. So is Lenin's analysis still valid a century later? As Paul Quinto states, studying the contemporary expressions of monopoly capitalism's key features shows that the logic and dynamic of the monopoly capitalist system remains fundamentally unchanged from Lenin's time. However, it shows that the forms and means of exploitation and oppression that characterize imperialism have evolved and intensified. This quote comes from a highly recommended book, Lenin's Imperialism in the 21st Century, published in 2017 by the Institute of Political Economy from the Philippines. The book features several authors, from Jose Maria Sison, Fred Angst, Pao Yu Ching, and others. This is an absolute must read for anyone interested in Lenin's analysis of capitalist imperialism and how this system has developed since. Let's begin in 1916, when Lenin published his pamphlet on imperialism. This pamphlet was published during the first inter-imperialist war, World War I, which ended in 1918. A decade later, the Great Depression arrived in 1929, which brought the capitalist world into deep crisis. This period lasted until the second inter-imperialist war, World War II. But during the Great Depression period, imperialism was in a different phase than it is today. Pao Yu Ching says, Imperialist countries used exports of their surplus products to relieve the pressure of overproduction. They used high import duties to block imports while depreciating their currencies to boost exports. These measures caused chaos, thus drastically reducing international trade, and further intensifying their economic depression. But things changed after World War II. The imperialists who won understood that these wars were not beneficial to them in the long term. After going through two of the world's largest wars over a decade of the Great Depression, things had to change. And with the US coming out on top of the second inter-imperialist war, US imperialists changed the game. The 1944 Bretton Woods Conference is probably the best place to start in understanding the current phase of imperialism. At this conference, they founded the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which are two key institutions that manage the global capitalist economy in service to imperialism today. Later in 1948, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade was set up to push down import tariffs and reduce non-tariffs trade barriers. And Pao Yu Ching states that, these post-war monetary and trade regimes laid down the necessary institutional framework for the new phase of imperialism and 20-some years of prosperity for capitalism. In addition, the Marshall Plan was initiated. After the Second World War, Europe was devastated with the U.S. virtually untouched. At this time, the U.S. produced 50% of the world's GDP, but it needed consumers and trading partners. The Marshall Plan was an initiative to rebuild Europe in order to develop trading partners, consumers of U.S. commodities, and to prevent the spread of communism, as the other major power in the world after the war was the USSR. Let's listen to Emanuel Wallerstein on this point. What the U.S. did in order to guarantee its hegemony is to make a deal with the Soviet Union. We call that deal Yalta, but it wasn't exactly what happened at the Yalta conference, but it's become 
uh, a mode of referring to it. And the deal had three parts. Part number one was the world will be divided into two segments where more or less the armies met. The Soviet Union would be uh, the dominant power in one third of the world and the US would be the dominant power in two thirds of the world. Coming with that deal was the tacit agreement that neither side would try by military means or otherwise to change those boundaries. Now that deal actually held until 1989. The second part of the deal was the United States was going to give considerable economic help to its two-thirds of the world, but it would give nothing to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was on its own in its third of the world. Uh, we call that the Marshall Plan. We did some similar things in, with, with Japan, uh, etc. Two reasons for that. One is uh, uh, to maintain the loyalty of your side. But the second reason is, it's no point in being the most efficient uh, producer in the world if you don't have anybody to buy your products. And the third part of the deal, the, th the part that seems most implausible, is that they were going to proclaim a cold war with each other and they were going to yell and shout and denounce each other constantly, all the time, and they didn't mean it. They didn't mean it in the sense that they were not going to do anything that would, st would destroy the first two parts of the deal. The, the point of shouting and yelling was not to change the other side, but to keep your own side in line. And uh, that was very effective. This high note of US hegemony, right? this high note of US hegemony lasts to circa 1970. That is the period that the French refer to in a wonderful phrase, the Trente Glorieuses, the 30 Glorious Years. This was the magnificent expansion, never to a level never before seen, of uh, economic production in the world system, the true industrialization of the world, the everything that we think occurred in the so-called industrial revolution to which people refer in the ter turn of the 19th century uh, actually occurs between 1945 and 1970. It didn't occur before that. The U.S. came out the victor at the end of World War II. Since the war was barely fought on U.S. soil, with the exception of Pearl Harbor, its economy flourished, becoming a global hegemon. The U.S. lost roughly 420,000 lives, while the USSR suffered a devastating 27 million deaths, and China lost 20 million lives. And with the U.S. at the top of its game after the war, it became the organizer and leader of the world imperialist system. It created the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, the U.S. Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, the Marshall Plan, and several economic and military aid programs financed and controlled from Washington. The U.S. expanded its global financial reach by expanding bank branches from 16 countries in 1918 to 55 countries in 1967. Antonio Tuhan Jr. in Lenin's Imperialism in the 21st Century says that this was all assisted by, among other things, a continued expansion of U.S. foreign oil, mining, and manufacturing interests, b spread of military bases, and c penetration of areas by government, military, and economic aid, including entrance into former colonies. A critical factor for being the leader in the world imperialist system is becoming the financial hegemonic power. U.S. financial hegemony was reached by equating the dollar with gold. Tuhan Jr. says, equating the dollar with gold set up a relationship of dependency of all capitalist nations on the U.S. monetary and financial system. Harry Magdoff states this clearly for us, which is quoted in the book, 
The reliance of the United States dollar means that, in the final analysis, the holders of the United States IOUs can use them only to purchase United States goods at United States prices. For a few decades after the war, the US maintained trade surpluses, but it eventually decreased and deficits increased, and countries began taking their dollars to exchange into gold held by the US. This caused the US gold stock to decrease, and President Nixon ended the gold standard in 1971. Then the US dollar itself became the dollar standard. Eventually, U.S. multinationals began doing business outside of the U.S., depositing their profits in American banks, but in Europe, which became known as Euro Dollars. This large amount of Euro Dollars outside of the U.S. was, as Pao Yu Ching states, critically important in establishing the dollar as the international currency and the U.S.'s leading role in global finance. This was the beginning of the flooding of tremendous amounts of US dollars into other countries, providing the US with the unique opportunity to establish a lead in international finance. Today, US dollars make up the majority of trading in the world's foreign exchange market. In 2014 alone, trading averaged $5.3 trillion per day. The problem with hegemony and the problem with uh, uh, the economic expansion of this kind is that it's self-destructive. If you have a super monopoly that earns enterprises in your country and people in your country enormous amounts of, of capital uh, which they can accumulate, then obviously other people would like to get in on the deal. And they try one way or another until they can, in fact, crack the monopoly. Okay? This always happens. It's not something special in this time. It happened in every previous occasion when there was an expansion of the world economy. The second thing that happens is uh, the rise in that period of Western Europe and Japan. And let me give you a, a very poignant and simple illustration of that. One of the key industries which was monopolized by the United States at that point was the automobile industry. In 1950s, the U.S. could produce cars so cheaply that they could ship them to Germany or Japan, or France, or Great Britain, and undersell locally produced uh, vehicles. Marvelous. You really control the sales, and you really get in the income. The problem is, as the decline of, uh, as the acquisition of other kinds of economic knowledge by Western Europe and Japan proceeded, that began to be inverted. For the first time in the mid-60s, we get German cars, the Volkswagen, we get Japanese cars, Toyota and others, who are able to do this, the reverse thing, to ship the stuff to the United States at a price level such that they could begin to compete with US industry. That automobile industry has been under that cloud ever since, uh, as it lost its monopoly. Wallerstein makes some excellent points here. After World War II from 1945 to 1970, the US was the complete dominant imperialist power in the world. But by 1970, US hegemonic power began to decline while the economies of Western Europe and Japan began to build themselves back up, with the help of the US of course, to the point of challenging US hegemonic power. This period is what Samir Amin calls collective imperialism. 
The idea of collective imperialism represents how imperialist nations responded to growing challenges to their hegemonic power in the world, economic, political, and military, and from the rising threats from the global south, or third world. To fend off these threats, these imperialist powers formed a united imperialist front against what is perceived as a collective threat to their hegemony. Amin says that imperialism since Lenin's time had a shift from the period of inter-imperialist conflict depicted by Lenin to the period of U.S. hegemony during the Cold War to collective imperialism. Collective imperialism being the period Wallerstein is describing with the example of the automobile industry. Then, by the end of the 1970s, imperialism also took a new form, the form of what we call today neoliberalism. To tackle the internal contradictions arising from the capitalist imperialist system, the imperialist powers then developed neoliberalism, which is a high degree of liberalization, deregulation, and privatization. This took the form of SAPs, Structural Adjustment Programs. The IMF and the World Bank established themselves as creditors to countries in the global south, which built regimes that implemented export-led, foreign-funded development economies. These poorer countries became prime targets for foreign trade and investments, becoming part of the neoliberal globalization strategy of the imperialist core. Here, Tuhan describes neoliberalism. In short, neoliberalism is a set of ideas or doctrine that holds free market capitalism as the best way of ensuring prosperity and freedom for all. Free market propaganda even includes free consumer choices to confuse people. But this definition is illusory or contradictory, in the sense that there is no such phenomenon as a free market in economies rife with monopolies of all forms, and especially in a situation dominated by monopoly capitalism. The reality is that monopoly corporations and multinationals practice all forms of monopoly in violation of free market rules and regulations. This is an important change in the history of the capitalist imperialist system, from U.S. hegemony to collective imperialism. Wallerstein also touches on this point. Once, however, the monopoly began to disappear, exactly as traditional analysts of capitalism have said, prices went down. Competition is good for prices. The problem is competition is not good for profits. Simple as that. More competition, more cheaper prices, and less profits. And that begins two things I want to go into them successively. First, the end of U.S. hegemonic power meant that they begin to lose relative power. And what do they do about it? The U.S. works very hard to slow down the decline of U.S. power. And they work out a program for that which every president, every president from Nixon to Clinton, and including, including Ronald Reagan, pursue the same program. This is my story. Okay? What is the program? The program is, first of all, they turned, uh, the United States turned to Western Europe and to Japan, and they said, in effect, you're no longer satellites, now you're partners. We're going to consult with you uh, on all major issues. We're going to create a trilateral commission. We're going to create a G7. We're going to create uh, a Davos World Economic Forum. We're going to create all kinds of mechanisms whereby we consult with each other. And the only thing we ask of you is that if you are pulling away from what the U.S. wants, don't pull too far. Okay? That's the, that's the deal. The second thing we're going to do, 
since now, we're not doing so well in terms of uh, accumulating capital, is we're going to give up the theme of development. People forget that, 197, that the United Nations in, in the late 1960s proclaimed the 1970s as the decade of development. Everybody believed in development. The Soviet Union believed in development. The United States believed in development. The Third World believed in development. And how is this development to occur? It was to be. It was uh, 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 creating internal protection for new industries. And although it was proclaimed to be the, uh, the decade of development, it turned out to be exactly the opposite because the line changed. Now we don't want you to have development uh, internally generated. We want you to produce for export. We want you to cut down on uh, the role of government. We want you to privatize. All these things which were called the Washington Consensus. An important development during this new phase of imperialism for the second half of the 20th century is the military aspect the aspect of U.S. militarism around the world. The 1947 National Security Act is a good place to start with this aspect of militarism. This law was a major restructuring of the United States' military and intelligence agencies, aimed at becoming the top manager of foreign affairs around the world. The 1947 NSA Act founded the CIA the Air Force, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the National Security Council, which is the most important group of advisors to the United States President on matters of foreign and domestic, quote, national security. Among other changes in the NSA Act of 1947, the military changed its name from the Department of War to the Department of Defense. The U.S. also went on to create the Military Industrial Complex, which is a set of institutions and corporations intertwined with social and political systems, large enough and powerful enough to become the top dominant military power in the world in order to manage this new phase of the capitalist imperialist system. By 1945, the U.S. controlled 2,000 military bases around the world, the largest collection of bases possessed by one power in world history. By 1989, the U.S. maintained 1,600 military bases, and today the U.S. has 800 military bases. Remember, these numbers are military bases outside of U.S. soil, on foreign territory. For the second half of the 20th century, U.S. foreign policy has been filled with dozens of interventions into other countries' affairs, overtly and covertly, from the Korean War to the Vietnam War, from the 1954 coup in Guatemala to the bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999. And with the age of nuclear proliferation, the world reached its peak in 1985 with over 60,000 nuclear weapons. Now, in the 21st century, we've seen nothing but endless wars and interventions on behalf of the U.S. military and intelligence agencies with no end in sight. Let's quickly recap the development of this capitalist imperialist system. 1. Capitalism came into existence in the 16th century. 2. By the 1980s, the capitalist imperialist system was developed. 3. In 1916, Lenin published his pamphlet outlining five economic features of the capitalist imperialist system. 4. World War II changes the capitalist imperialist system into a new phase, with the U.S. becoming a truly hegemonic imperialist power in the world. 5. In the 1970s, the U.S. began to lose its true hegemonic power, and other imperialist powers rose to compete with each other again. And six, since the 1970s, Western Europe and Japan, led by the U.S., developed into a form of collective imperialism using policies of neoliberalism. 
This is a decent start to understanding imperialism in the past century and how it has developed into its current phase. There is a lot more to learn, like social imperialism, but this is the foundation to begin your journey into learning more about the capitalist imperialist system. In the next video, we will discuss four characteristics of this current phase of imperialism laid out by Pao Yuqing, which is found in the same book of which many of the quotes used in this video came from. These four characteristics are, one, the hegemonic status of the US dollar and the US domination in international finance, two, the internationalization of production and accumulation, three, the interconnectedness of the global capitalist class, and four, the unresolvable and deepening contradictions between the capitalist state and its people. This is the Peace Report. Thanks for watching. I'll be getting busy on the weekends. I'll be getting busy on the weekdays. Listening to people see what they think and combine that with what we say. Cause I want them to play what we sing and then sing what they want to relay. Cause I be sipping coffee in the morning. Cause revolution ain't no fucking tea party.